Okay, I believe in starting on time. It is 2.15, according to the atomic clock. Is that correct? Is this too loud? I'm a loud person. It's okay to tell me I'm too loud. To ask any questions. And what I want you to walk out with is, well, let me ask some questions. Who does JavaScript development? Good, you're in the right place. Who does React? All right, that's all right, that's all right. This presumes some React, but I will try and make sure I don't go too far on that. Who does TypeScript? Okay, who does React and TypeScript together? For the record, half a hand went up. It's an odd combination to try and keep straight. Uh, there was someone giving a talk uh, before mine in the slot before. Um, the React people don't necessarily approve of TypeScript. Uh, and so things can get out of sync. Who does, <laughs> asking the question that you know the answer to, priceless. Who does React, TypeScript, and testing? Anyone? Anyone? Paul does. Uh, I have a question. So sure. If nobody uses React TypeScript, why are you giving a certification? Because people should. And I think people like, so we just saw that. React, TypeScript, React, TypeScript. People are a little intimidated by that combination. And as that presentation uh, an hour ago made the business case for it, it's a good fit, especially in circumstances where you have a development team with lots of different people, and you need to enforce the contracts instead of the JavaScript way of, well, let's just hope it works. So, theoretically, then mm -hmm. React supports TypeScript. Mm -hmm. People just don't use it. Mm -hmm. They use just plain vanilla JavaScript. They're using uh, ES6. Almost everybody is using ES6, at least. So, they're, they're, bu they're buying into some of this. And this world that I'm going to describe in this little journey in the next hour has gotten so much better in the last year. Uh, React and TypeScript only make sense if every single thing that you count on um, includes TypeScript definitions. If you have to write them yourself, you're in trouble. And if you don't use any TypeScript definitions, you're in trouble. Uh, it's the combination, though, with testing that I really want to make the case for Plant a seed in your head that this is a better way of doing it, not because you have to eat your vegetables, and all grown-ups do testing. Nobody does testing. But what I want to show to you is this is such a better word, way to work than type some stuff, go over to your browser, hit reload, and pray. And then you made a mistake, go back over to your ID, and your head is switching back and forth constantly between your code and the browser. TDD, you stay in one place. So please, feel free to ask questions as we go along. The conference, for the ones that are recorded like this one, would prefer to save questions until the end. It's my talk. I can do whatever I want. So let's ask questions as we go along. Any questions so far? Who is going to follow along with the materials we go along? All right, cool. And I'm going to have to sit down because I'm going to be doing some typing. All right. So let's begin at the top of this documentation pile. And I talk a little bit about, okay, we got React, a lot of people doing that. Got TypeScript, a lot of people doing that. Combination, not so much. When you put in TDD for test-driven development, you really get down into a, a small pool. There should be more of this. Let's demystify it, make you feel comfortable, and get you curious about the topic. You take the material, go back, and work on your own. And again, if you want the, the thing I'm looking at up here, that's the URL. You can also see it here. If you decide later, he was right, I should have followed along, tell me. And you can either read that URL up there, or if you can't read it, tell me to go back to this page and let you see the URL. All right, let's get started. The world of modern JavaScript is insane. It has 4 billion dependencies. Hello World has 4 billion packages, and Node Modules has 270 megabytes just to sneeze. And everything is changing daily. You will never keep your brain uh, on top of all of this. 
Fortunately, the world of React and uh, uh, React is a Facebook product. Facebook has realized this. They've put out a, we'll call it a scaffolding system, a project template system, whatever you want to call it, called Create React App. Raise your hand if you've ever used Create React App. Okay, all of you should be using it after this because you're outsourcing to Dan Abramoff the insanity. They will keep this version works with that version, works with that version, works with that version. This is the official list of tools that will work together so that I can have a modern development experience without owning all of those dependencies. Right. Yep. Apart from creating the app, that creates a folder structure. And if you look at 20 different React websites, they all have, apart from three, two or three commas. Correct. Thrown things, you know, under assets here. You're right. Uh, and in fact, the way I believe in is not the standard. Um, but Create React App itself does not have, it only has like four files that it generates. So it does not have an opinion. It has an opinion on lots of things. That ain't one of them. I'm uh, the single responsibility principal and functional organization. So I don't put my controllers and my services and whatever. I do invoices customers, and then everything related for that, including tests. That's a good point, though. Um, there isn't a standard uh, style guide that says that's the way it should be. With Angular, they have more opinions. So you install Create React App on your system, and you run this command, and it says, go run the generator to make a directory called my app. And then there's this thing after it. Um, after a while, when Create React, got po Create React App got popular, they started to realize we can't do everything. We need an extension facility. More specifically, they said, we're not doing TypeScript, so we need an extension facility so that someone else can do TypeScript. And that's what this is. You use that extension facility in Create React App to say, go get this other package and use it as part of creating my React app. And this other thing has been around for at least a year and a half, quite mature. It is create React app, but for TypeScript. Hallelujah. Because we are outsourcing to W. Monk, the guy behind that repo, the craziness of trying to keep this up to date with create React app and the rest of React. And then you CD into the directory that you just created, and you start up your application. Any questions so far? Lots of good documentation on this. This isn't the important part of the talk, so I'm going to speed through it. Uh, I, because of bandwidth, I'm not actually going to run this command. Wave my hand. I ran that command, and I now have in my IDE called WebStorm a Create React app project. In fact, with WebStorm, you can actually run um, Create React app from within the GUI. You don't have to go to the command line. Here I am. I'm, I've got my project that I can go and do interesting things in. Let's go ahead and get some pixels on the screen. Show me a page. So I can run the terminal and say npm. Here is the scripts that are available. So I'm going to say this one, npm run script start, which will run this script. And it's alias to do that. So npm run script start. On the command line, chug a lug a lug. It fires up. It does all the parsing. And nope, this is from my previous example. And I get the starter application for React. Uh, which has a spinning thing and some stuff, et cetera. And I'm running it in a console. So everybody's happy on that. Now, what's one thing that's nice about using something visual like an IDE, a visual IDE called WebStorm, instead of getting this text-oriented view down here, I can instead show the NPM scripts and get a visual view of these things that I can run. 
And so I'm going to run uh, npm start in the GUI, in this little GUI window down here. So it's running fine, same thing that we saw before. Speeding right along. I can run the build script, and the idea here is what I just ran was for development. And it's a really productive experience. I type something and save, and it rebuilds the universe in memory, reloads my page. But that's not what you want to send over a, a 2G phone to Africa. You want a JavaScript minify blah, 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 57 things, a build version. And so you want to run this version of React app to get the production build. And it will generate a build directory, which is a self-contained universe, which you can copy to your web server. Um, and I could run that in the IDE as well. Now, let's get on to what we care about testing. Uh, there's also a version of this start script for testing. So I can run it, and it's coming down here. It's going to run all of my tests and tell me that uh, nothing has uh, changed since the last commit. So I'll go to one of my tests, and I'll say expect one to be two. Save it. And my test failed. Well, that's a pretty ugly way to be doing tests. Instead, wouldn't it be nice if the IDE gave me a way to do tests? And it does. So I'm going to add a new configuration in WebStorm called Adjust Configuration. And the only thing I'm going to add to this is what it suggests as a couple of these options. Dash, dash, watch all, dash, dash, env equals JS DOM. Again, these are documented in Jest, which is the test runner from Facebook uh, for all kinds of projects, including React. Now, when I run that in my IDE, I get a nice pretty view of all of my tests. And I see that one of my tests failed, and I can change that to one, save it, and it automatically reruns my test for me as soon as I save, and all of my tests pass. So uh, Create React App is a generator for your project. Always use it. Don't try and simulate what it does. The React Scripts TS does all that for TypeScript. Jest is a test runner, and we've got all this assembled up together in our ID. Before I go any further, any questions? Sure. Good question. So this is the run configuration for Jest. Uh, I got to it by doing plus, and uh, WebStorm has different kinds of run configurations for the task that you're working on. And I might have a task for running uh, an NPM script or a React Native kind of thing or whatever. And instead, I've got something for Jest. I accepted all of the defaults, except for I pass some options to Jest. Okay, so far? Yes, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, there was a React DOM reference that I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Yep, that's one of the most important parts of this whole thing. So make sure I get back to that later. Okay, so we'll skip along on this conclusion. We're set up. We're going to do one little thing. Um, this whole thing, we don't need all that crap kind of get in the way as we do a lot of typing and testing and poking around. So let's slim that down a little bit. Let's make our first edit to some React TypeScript code in app.tsx. I'm going to go open that up, and we see that it's got import of CSS, import of the logo, a whole bunch of stuff here. I'm going to replace that instead with this which is a lot less for me to worry about when it comes to uh, doing testing and stuff. I just have a div with an H1. Um, but I also see that the IDE has warned me, and this is really a TypeScript warning. You see the TS6133 means the TypeScript compiler has said, hey, you're importing something and you're not using it. 
Maybe you want to get rid of that. So I'll get rid of that, which means I can also, what was that, the SVG? I can also go, go delete that file, clean up a little bit more. And I'm not doing a whole bunch of styling on this, so I'll get rid of the app.css and delete it over here as well. I've kind of cleaned my space out a little bit on, on what I'm using for all this stuff. And so when I go back and look at it in the browser, it's really simple looking now. Um, and so scrolling through these kinds of things, that was an error about the, uh, the import where the TypeScript compiler said, you're importing this, but you're not using it. What if I don't like that error? What if I, like, that's a warning, not an error, or don't show it to me at all. It's controlled, the TypeScript compiler is controlled with a configuration file, usually at the root of your project. Uh, it's in JSON, and it has a whole bunch of options to configure TypeScript for your project. So I could have added this line in there and shut up that red squiggly. But whenever you do that, you're like messing with fire. So just go f figure out the original problem and fix it. All right, on to the next thing. A, a couple more housekeeping things before we get into really the topic of this talk. Uh, styling, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the question was, why do I do this kind of laborious, uh, I define the class, and then I do export default app down here. That is, that is a style that is predominant in the Microsoft TypeScript handbook. In some style things that will enforce it, the TS lint that I'm about to show will enforce it. Uh, it is, um, if I'm doing a TypeScript module that has multiple classes that I want to export, and then I have an export for the default, I can get myself confused sometimes about what's the default, what isn't. And if I just follow a pattern of uh, the last line is the default, then I can easily spot it. It's kind of self-defense for me six months from now, which might not remember what it is. Uh, that's a good point because another thing you can do is that and do a named import. Uh, but the world of JavaScript believes in something called single responsibility principle that each file should do one thing and not have like three classes in it or something like that. So one file, one class, one export is kind of a common pattern. Any other questions before I go on? Uh, next thing, you see this a lot in all programming languages, styling, also known as linting. Uh, your line is too long. You use double quotes when you should have used single quotes. You have semicolons, but we on this project don't believe in semicolons. That can all be configured with something called a linter, and the world of TypeScript has a linter called TSLint. Create React app with the TypeScript extensions, wires up TSLint for you, but what if I want to do something a little bit differently? So let's go take a look at where that file is, it's in the root, tslint.json, and it gets most of its work from somewhere else. These are the 57,000 little style Nazi questions that are wired up for you that you can then opt out of or add new rules in this file. So uh, that is about linting. We're not going to do anything on that because it's not too important for the purpose of this. Let's get into the topic of the talk, testing. We saw that we have a test by default generated uh, from the scaffold from Create React app with the TypeScript extensions. Let's talk about this a little bit. This is a TSX file which means uh, a TypeScript file with, JavaScript, with JSX extensions. So it's allowed to put in the middle of TypeScript something that looks like HTML. That's what JSX is about. And it mixes the language and the markup together in one unit in rich and powerful ways. 
in order for this to work, if I had this file without this in it, I'm in, I'm in trouble, not just because of the import here, but because of this. And you see that um, this is saying you're doing JSX, but you're not importing React. The React DOM in the test uh, lets me do these two lines, which these are the only two times I will do it for the rest of the, the day or re rest of the hour. I'm going to switch over to using a fake DOM. So that question, was that your question? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to wind up using Enzyme and, and uh, its mount and that kind of stuff, which uses JS DOM. Uh, agreed. Um, the generator generates these two lines because this is the most basic test that we'll see if the universe assembled itself. Because in your app, you're actually going to import React DOM and wire up the app using React DOM. That's done here. The tippy tippy top of my React application gets the React DOM and renders the root component. Okay, so um, in Jest, I've already created a Jest run configuration to let the IDE put a visual face on testing so that testing is more approachable when it's visual than doing it from the command line. You're going to see me refer to this a lot. Fail faster. You're going to fail. So why fail in production? Well, that's why we write tests. Well, you're going to fail in test writing, so why not have the IDE tell you immediately that you failed before even running your tests? And that's where TypeScript can come in. So let's go ahead and fail a little faster. I'm going to add these three lines to my first test. I've already done this to a degree. And my test runner says it, it it expected actual to be expected. These are wrong. When I correct that and save, then my test passed. And you notice how fast Jest reran the tests. That's one of the nice things about this approach with JS DOM, which is a fake DOM. I don't have to fire up Chrome, listen to my CPU fan go off, as much as I like to hear your fan, uh, and then eventually get the results. Having this cycle of typing, testing, running, result, typing, is a much better way of development. And you see the IDE actually tells you this test failed. Um, okay, so I'm going to put it back in a working mode, test pass. Sure. You're exactly right. It will say, hey, I don't have this thing called a document or a window dot document or whatever it is that is the DOM. And this watch all is a way to have the test runner start and continue running and watch for file changes so that I don't have to fire up every time I want to run my test, I don't have to fire up Node.js and import the universe and get everything together. I can get it all in memory. And maybe it remembers some of the TypeScript compiling and transpiling that I've done. Okay, TDD basics. Here's the way I work. I turn off tabs. Dun, dun, dun. I turn off this. I turn off all my tools and then I split the window vertically. And I put my code that I'm testing on the left and the test that I'm writing on the right and my test runner on the bottom, except at home where Paul has a Dell ultra-wide. And I put the test runner on the side and I can get all kinds of stuff on the screen. But this makes it immediately visible to me. I don't even have to think about it. Code, test, output. I don't have... The tabs would be a distraction that makes me think, where, where am I actually at? 
Uh, so that's the TDD basics. And there's another thing that we can do for TDD basics. Let's see, when do I turn that on? I'll go ahead and turn that on now. Is, um, uh, when I run this, all tests, Hmm. All right, I'll skip over that part and come back to that later. All right, so I can now do a real test. And what I want to do for this quote unquote real test is use an extension to Jest called Enzyme. Enzyme is an add on package for Jest, which gives you uh, more assertions you can do against a fake DOM. It's a little bit of a higher level thing to work in, which means a trip to our NPM and the wonderful chance to make some mistakes uh, and have more dependencies that can break over time. So as that's running, with this I can now, instead of that other way of like mounting the entire tree, I can use something called the shallow renderer, which will get just one thing, no children, no parent, one little component, and let you test just that. It is unit testing, isolation, and it's fast, and it's productive, and it's a lot better than reloading your browser as you develop. So I'm gonna take that, come over, add it to my test, and when I run it, it's gonna fail, if I remember correctly. Yes, because I, don't, I haven't imported shallow. Nice thing about IDEs, you can walk up to assemble, alt, enter, and it will import for you. And it will put it in the right sorted place. Now TypeScript has some rules about this, which I haven't configured correctly yet, about ordering of things. I like to put things in groups. My, my own code is in the last group. So now when it runs, ah, it's going to say I've got an internal error because I installed the package of Enzyme, but I didn't go and install, uh, connect that package to Jest. Jest doesn't know about Enzyme. It doesn't know it should use Enzyme. So I'm gonna add this test at this, this file at this location, and when I do, the universe is going to be good again. Set up a test, is that right? Never remember. So now when I restart this, and the app can import that, my test runs. What was my test doing in this case? I talked about Enzyme as being um, a lot more convenient and a lot faster. It's taking the app component, this is the app component, it's creating this shallow universe that doesn't mount any children. If app had inside of it something like counter, it would ignore that. And assigning it to something called wrapper. And then I can do this really nice syntax for looking in the wrapper and saying, go find the H1, find its text, and expect it to be hello react. I'll get this on the same line. That is so much nicer than going over to Chrome, hitting reload, looking to see if you got it right, going back, and remembering to check the 20 things that you just did before. All right, so we have our first test in there. We've imported shallow. Let's add a third test uh, to see something a little bit more like TDD. And it fails because I wrote the test before I did the implementation. That is test-driven development. And it makes me pause and think about what I'm trying to freaking do at this spot. I'm trying to put in a paragraph. And I want it to shut up, so I'm going to go and put in the paragraph to make my test shut up. Now when I save, all my tests pass, and I feel good about the universe. 
I'm working in a slow, methodical way as I implement headings and things like that. And guess what? Did you see me open a browser? I never went back to my browser. Now, occasionally, I will stop every now and then and go back to my browser just to make sure that I'm still being sane about it. You still running? Oh, no, it's because I put that error in there. And there's my paragraph. So if I still want occasionally to see not just testing, but Chrome, is it happy, I can do so. Any questions? Uh, let's see, nothing imports it, so it would be ignored. Nothing in your production code uh, imports it. You're gonna run that You're going to run that build script, and it's going to ignore all of that. At least it should. That's a good point, though, because you don't want that stuff leaking in. In fact, you would like to have it. It's going to be a dev dependency. So in production, it's not even going to be a production dependency. Enzyme wouldn't even be importable. All right. Uh, let's see. All right, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Let's say I get stuck and I've got an error on something. Um, uh, all right, I'm going to do a cleanup. I want to take this out. I'm going to take that paragraph out, I believe. And I'm going to add, I'm going to start doing some development. I'm going to add a method. I want this label to be a little bit reusable. So, for example, I'm going to add a method called label. And then I'm going to change my h1 to get its value from the label. And my tests still all pass correct. I'm going to turn that off so that, uh, let's see. Aha, thank you. Which test is? Oh, because I got rid of the paragraph, too. Okay, and um, I didn't write a test for that method that I just added to do the label, so let me go write a test for it. And notice that I'm not going through the DOM at all. I'm just creating an instance of app and testing the method. And that's a really cool way to develop as well, because I've eliminated this entire pile of React DOM rendering and just an enzyme parsing HTML and stuff like that. Um, let's see, so the, let, let's say that I want to change it so that it passes in a value and uppercases it. And I want to make it break first. So I want my test to give me the behavior that I'm about to implement. And so I'm going to change this line to be in the generates a label. I'm going to change you to be that. And it's going to fail for several reasons. One, I'm passing in a value to something that doesn't expect a value. So TypeScript helped me fail faster by telling me I violated the API. And then this wasn't true because it's not all uppercase. So now I can go over and fix my implementation. The H1 needs to pass a value to the method, and then the method needs to accept a value called name. And I'm going to get it to return a value that is this uh, template string format. And that works, but TypeScript tells me another problem that I, don't, I didn't put a type on this. So I could have passed in a number. So I'm going to put in a string on this, and then that is fine. Now this other test, the renders the heading, is failing because I don't have a React there. And so now my test should pass. All right, my test passed, good. 
All right, so I fixed the TypeScript part of my new API that I did in test-driven development thanks to TypeScript. Um, one thing that happens a lot is you're like, you're writing a test and you're like, why is this failing? I don't know, sprinkle console logs everywhere until I chase this thing down. That sucks. What would be really cool is if I could put a breakpoint right there and then go to this test and run this test, or run all the tests, I'll do that, under the debugger. And it does the whole universe that I just did under Node.js, I'm gonna do it under the Node.js debugger. And it stops at that point of execution and lets me look at the name argument that was passed in. And the this, which is the app, which is the React component. Much more civilized way of doing testing is to use the debugger. Whenever you get stuck on something, or frankly, when you just want to kind of uh, explore and interact with the code at a point of execution and go into a prompt and type some things. All right, and I'll take out that breakpoint. I'm gonna skip this segment so we can make some more progress. Everything I just described running under Node.js for your JavaScript environment, you can also do in WebStorm using Chrome as your JavaScript environment. And stop at a breakpoint and look around and you'll see that you have a real window and a Chrome property on the window that represents Chrome as a browser. All right, JavaScript and the ES6 parts of TypeScript that you get. Uh, so I'm gonna go change my test back to be a little simpler and I'm gonna change my uh, application to be a little simpler. And the test runner is still running in the test pass. Classes and fields, AKA this, the this value. Um, I want to make a reusable component that doesn't have the message hardwired into it. I wanna extract the label. So the first thing I could do is go take this make something called label, and then make a const, and where did I put that, inside the, yeah. Const label equals that. And sure, I've moved it out of the JSX HTML, I know, JSX, but that's, it's still encapsulated in there and I can't override it in any way. So let's move it up to being a class attribute in Python or a field or whatever you wanna call it in TypeScript. I'm gonna take this thing, move it up to here. And I'm required to say whether it's public or private or whatever, so I'm gonna make it public. But then this fails. And the TypeScript compiler helpfully tells you, hey, maybe dumb dumb, you wanted a this in front of it. So now I have something a little more reusable. I can subclass app, override label, and have a way of replacing the label that's used in this. So that's pretty good. But we can go a little bit further. Let's talk about handling uh, click functions, event handlers. I want to be able to click on the H1 and see an alert. And for this, I'm gonna fire you back up because we're gonna need the browser for the first part of this. All right, so I've got an H1, and I wanna replace that with this, so that there's an alert that happens. And I get told, um, well, you've got a TypeScript problem on that. That's okay. Uh, I actually get the alert, the alert pops up, but did you notice that it happened not because I clicked? It happened as soon as I reloaded. Why is that? Because this, inside here was immediately evaluated. I wanted it to be, I want it to be evaluated later when the event actually happens. This is in the middle of a JSX block. It's getting evaluated. So the solution for that is to make what's called an arrow function, an ES6 arrow function that says, hey, when this event runs, collect its arguments and go execute that code. And with this, I would be able to run it, except 
the T.S. Lent style Nazi has a warning in there saying, the powers that be have decreed you can't put lambdas there for performance reasons. Okay, powers that be, you win. I'll, I'll go ahead and do the changing on this. I could go shut that up in my TS Lint file with that. I won't do that to save a little bit of time. But I can do what they actually want me to do, which is take that logic out of the JSX, out of the markup, move it over to the class where God really wants it to be. So I'm going to make this method called handle click. Newsflash, this isn't going to work the first time. And then change my on click handler to call it. And not call it, to reference it so that it will get called when the function, when the event handler is fired. So this all looks pretty good. And when I go back over and click on it, I get a hello world. So we've done everything that was supposed to be done with the JS, the preventing the, the type function. However, we have a little bit of an issue with the this. Let's show that we have an issue with this by putting, by changing it from a static alert to showing the label. Uh, now when I do this, I'm all good, I'm all good, I'm all good. I'm not good because label doesn't exist on undefined. This, in this case, is the event not the instance of the class. This is a weird thing I'm about to show you. The solution to this is arrow functions up here. I'm going to assign this, instead of being a method, it's going to be a property that's an arrow function that looks like a method. Now it's going to get the right this. And when I click, I see this dot label. All right, JSX um, has things to put the typing information on the uh, event handler information. We will skip that for now. Any questions before I go on? So that warning about arrow functions not being a good thing, mm -hmm. I mean, that's really a convenient way of writing things, and so that really is true. Right. Here, I, you're, I should have mentioned that. You're right. Here's yet another point that even the better way that I did has some people that complain about that as well. Uh, the chances that you write a Yelp or a Facebook scale app or anything that actually runs into this problem is pretty slim. So the, I believe the point you were making is a point I agree with. We were doing classes as our components. There's another style in React called um, SFCs, uh, functional components, stateless functional components. Let's convert our, our app to use a little bit of this. Um, so I'm going to put my app back in a simpler fashion. And I'm going to make a heading component. And first, I'm going to... Um, go to my test and change it to use a heading component which I haven't implemented yet. So I'm going to go over here, and that is the second test. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I left some stuff out of it. just the class. Are we good again? Yes, okay, heading is not defined. Well, yeah, duh, I haven't implemented it. Master of the obvious. Let's do a tiny heading component, and I need to um, implement it, so I'm going to implement it for now in the uh, file that I already have. That is a component, believe it or not, a simple, fun a stateless functional component. And it is an arrow function which returns a, J a JSX H1. 
And if I import that now, I test pass. All right, good. All my tests pass. Um, and you see that my IDE generated the named import for me. That's good, but my app isn't using it. So let's get my app to use it. But I talked about the shallow renderer won't look at children. So I'm going to need mount, which is the other kind of renderer, which will. So I'm going to write a test which uses it, which fails because I have an imported mount. And then it's going to fail because I haven't added the heading in. Oh, no, I've got it right there. Yep, all right, good. So now I need to go change that from having the H1 directly embedded to using the heading, and my test should pass. Yep, good. So I have a parent component app which uses a child component called heading, and it is a uh, stateless functional component. The single responsibility principle, though, I've already made a mistake. I put two things in one file. Boo! So I want to extract that and make a new file called heading.tsx. And when I add this in, I haven't exported it or anything, so I need to add the export. Note that my IDE noticed that I had JSX and helpfully generated that line for me. Now, my heading is now in the wrong place. So I'm going to delete this and ask my IDE to import it for me. And we should be back in business. Nope. Oh, that's right, because my app no longer knows what a heading is. So I'm going to import the heading, and now I should be back in business. However, I have a test in one component. I'm testing heading in the app test file. So what I should do is extract this into its own test file. And then I can test just the heading with a test file that's just for that. If it's OK with you, I will speed up since we only have a few minutes and only go through code that's in here. Is that OK? Or would you prefer to see the code actually working? speed up and get through the material? All right, cool. All right, now, with all of this going on, I've got a component. Sure, I've got a heading component. But it doesn't really have the TypeScript typing information on it. If I go ask my IDE, what is this thing? It'll say it's a JSX element. It's not a component. Well, I want to say you're actually a React component. And when I do that, now when I go ask my IDE what this thing is, it says it's a React stateless component. And it can help warn me and it help me fail faster when I do stupid things. So for example, if I come in here and refer to an interface that doesn't exist, it can warn me about it, except I'm supposed to put that in a bracket. All right, so speeding up, sharing properties between components. Uh, let's refactor this a little bit so that the heading component has a little bit less inside of it. It's a dumb presentational component. It should get stuff passed into it, do its job, and pass stuff back out. So for example, it should not know that you want to say hello to world. It should be willing to say hello to anybody. And so my heading component needs a prop called recipient that I want to pass a value into. Let's fail first by writing a test. So in my heading test file, I'm going to change to have recipient passed in. And a TypeScript's immediately going to tell me, wait, 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 wait. You don't have any props, much less a prop called recipient. Go fix that. And I'll be like, ah, oh, you're right. I need a prop called recipient that's a string. So I'll go over to my single functional, my stateless functional component and add some property information using TypeScript, inline type because FFC is this thing called a generic, which can have props and state information passed in to model how you're allowed to use this thing. So TypeScript now knows how heading is supposed to be used, but we don't really like to have inline type information. We want to extract it into an interface, which might have 57 things inside of it, 
and then just say, oh yeah, that's where my props come from. Um, our component isn't using this prop at the moment. It's being passed in, but I need to change my H1 to grab recipient off the props. Now let me go ahead and do that because that is part of failing faster and a cool feature. Um, so I will change this to have that. As I'm now writing this, autocomplete knows what's possible on props because it's in the interface. It knows not only that recipient is allowed, but knows that it's a string. That also applies over when you're writing your tests and you're wondering what is on this thing. You can get autocomplete and red squigglies and fail before you even write your test. Uh, it can be cumbersome to write props all the time. So there is a syntax that in uh, ES6, object destructuring. So instead of saying, I'm going to get an object that might have some stuff in it, all I care about is recipient. So go and destructure this. And then everything in my code knows the only thing from the outside world that I'm going to care about is recipient. I unpacked the contents of that object. Well, I've done all this, but I haven't made it possible to use heading with a default. Um, and default props is something that is pretty common in React. I'd like to shut that up. And so what I can do in my interface is make that optional with a question mark. I've made it optional, but I haven't assigned a default yet. Um, and the default, let's see, is with this. I'm doing the default as an ES6 default assignment. All right, on to the next part. Class components. We just did a uh, stateless functional component with React prop information passed in, and we wrote an interface. We can do the same thing on the class side with a counter. And the counter is a component with a render, and it does its stuff and re returns this stuff. Well, let's, let's pat, first pass in a prop. I'm going to write a test for that. And I'm going to change this to be a generic, which inlines the prop information, saying that this component allows a prop called label to be optional, and it's assigned a find string. And then I do this dance to have default props on a class. And so by default, if you don't hand counter a label, it will use count as the label. And then in my render, I do that, and I get a label. But it's better to extract that inline uh, type information into its own interface so you can refer to it. You can also import it in your tests and make assertions or make the shape of things over in your tests. Then I go back into my app and I can use that component. All right, I'm going to stop at this point and talk about the stuff that's remaining. I made it through class components. This one, but especially this one on event handling, is mind-blowing about how you can... By the way, did you notice I never went back to the browser? Did all that development staying in my tool, not context switching, not getting lost about where I was. More importantly, I don't have to go click 57 things every time I change things to make sure I didn't break the stuff that I was just working on. My tests either pass or they don't. It's a really fast, productive way to get into the flow of development. When you get into event handling, it can be pretty cool to write a test which simulates a click so that you don't have to go clickety-clickety all through your app generating all the possible interactions. And in this tutorial step, I, I show doing a shift click, and other kinds of things, and then getting information into TypeScript to know and prove 
that your code is doing things right before the test even runs. I will stop at that point and take any questions, and I will also take questions over at the booth. Um, does anybody have anything they'd like to add about either TypeScript or testing for React? Actually, I just want to ask, because I mean, TypeScript's a bit out there. Mm -hmm. you know, we're happy with the S6. Uh, how much of this value is available there? What would be the difference in that experience? If you don't want to do the TypeScript part, the Jest is actually a better experience. Because you can go, there are people on Stack Overflow who will answer questions. We'll need it more. Sure. Yeah, maybe. But that was my other side of the coin. You don't get the fail faster like you do with TypeScript. In TypeScript, over here, you'll get a red squiggly that you wouldn't have gotten with plain JavaScript or ES6 unless you wrote a test for that. You would need to write a test for all the combinations of your default props and optional props just to prove that it did the behavior you expected. Do you have a hand up back here? No, all right. Any other questions? But yes. Charts uh, are you know, a common feature in uh, several UIs. Uh, the charts seem to do funky things like they declare constant labels and they have this thing that you stop that inside. Yep. Uh, so the question is, how do you do testing on weird components that you plug into your system, like charts that are very runtime and dynamic and kind of before uh, figure things out as they go? You would hope that they expose an interface to you in small enough units that you can maintain some sanity. Sure, the entire thing might be magic upon magic upon magic, but it might be a little slice of kind of magic that you can deal with. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if you have no control over that component, you're screwed. You have to hope that they're writing some tests. The TypeScript part is also kind of interesting on that. I mean, how do you model in type information something as completely arbitrary as that? The TypeScript people over the last year and a half have put this crazy machinery into the type system for Angular. So if you, wanted, if you enjoy the idea of curling up at night in front of a warm fire with the TypeScript handbook and learning about type theory, you're in the right place. Any other points or questions? Yep. So we do unit testing for stateless components. So we do unit yeah. mm -hmm. testing for, for teleport. I mean, like, they are basically just a, a, a function. Mm -hmm. I remember they're always the same, so. Yeah. They, there is like a library to algebraic all of them automatically. I don't know. Is there? I don't think there is. No, no, no. You're, you're right that uh, stateless functional components should be drop dead simple to test. You're right. Except that it's only if they're designed to have a surface area that has almost nothing exposed other than what it needs which is why I was showing really zeroing down, and in some of the later things, zeroing down on the event information. Don't pass me an event, like the HTML click event, the entire universe of HTML click event, which could be 57 combinations of how I clicked, where I clicked. How do you know what it is really interested in? Instead, only pass in a handler for yes or no. Did you shift click or not? And then you'll process that, process that and tell your parent yes or no. And then it's really easy to test if it's designed to be testable. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Any other points? Yep. Can you show again how you persecute it? I mean, WebStorm isn't doing anything that can't be done from the command line. Uh, I did this through the command line. Sorry. So I made, I made a configuration called that, and I will stop all of this, and I ran it. This will run the test, and because I put dash dash watch all, it will continue running. It won't exit. No, I mean running the application itself. 
Uh, for running the application itself, I did this. I ran the NPM script. Uh, come, over to, come over to the booth and I'll show you. Thank you, everybody, for not falling asleep. Oh, my baby.